<laughs> so before we start, let me just do a, a quick introduction. So thank you very much for everyone to join us, uh, for joining us today in the afternoon. Um, this session is brought to you by VLAN Asia. And before we start, uh, if you can look at the screen, there is a WhatsApp number there, uh, plus 6012-266-0189. If you have any inquiries on products or any services, you can actually uh, WhatsApp that number. Uh, we would also like to encourage everyone to follow us on our social media, which is uh, Facebook and LinkedIn. We also have a YouTube channel that we will upload all the videos uh, for the recording for all the webinars that we have hosted so far. You can actually look for it uh, on YouTube. Uh, you can search us up at VLAN Asia uh, on, our, on our social media, Facebook, LinkedIn, as well as YouTube. Uh, so for today's session, we are we have uh, <coughs> two lovely ladies with us to present to us design thinking innovation through empathy. Uh, we have Jun Junel, Junel, right? <laughs> also known as. Hi, Al. absolutely got it right the first time. Junel, 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 yeah. right? <laughs> Junel, also known as L, is the learning and growth leader of uh, at Storehub as a design thinking uh, practitioner. practitioner she enjoys working through any complex challenges in an organi organization or business. She has also spent several years coaching teams through areas of problem solving and effective collaboration in projects, all with design thinking as a guide principle. So that's Janelle. And then we have Isabel, who is the co-founder of Busy Butts Co, a talent management and learning experience consultation, a consultancy firm. Sorry, let me let people in. Um, she is a certified trainer, facilitator, and coach with design thinking at the heart of a program and experience design. She currently consults on and develops workshops for online and offline learning and sharing. So today's session is going to be very interactive. That's the reason why we use this uh, system today, which is uh, more like teams on uh, meeting on Teams rather than a live webinar. So if you have any questions, you can drop them in the Q&A section or the chat box. And also when the uh, facilitators actually ask you questions, you can actually unmute your mics. But throughout the session, I will be muting the mics if it's not active. So yeah, I'm going to hand it over to Junelle and Isabel. Over to you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, Norman. Norman. Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started. I'm going to share my screen. And right, there we go. How is it, Isabel? Can you see it? Uh, not yet. Yes, I see it now. Okay, great. So hi again, everyone. Um, our topic for today is design thinking, innovation through empathy. So, you know, innovation is quite a big word and people often think that it has to be complex or it has to include high-end technology. But I'm here to tell you that that's not what innovation has to be about. In fact, what's most important about innovation is that it is useful and meaningful for us to move forward. And so in this webinar, we'll be touching on how empathy, which is a core step in design thinking, can actually help us do that. OK, so but before we get started, let's just have some um, like house rules here. So the first thing, um, as Norman mentioned, uh, you can have your camera switched on. That would be great so we can see your um, reactions and get that vibe from you as well. Um, but for most of the for most of this session, your mic will be switched off. That being said, we will be asking a few questions here and there. And um, if you want to answer, you can switch on your mic and respond, or you can also type your response in the chat box, and we'll keep an eye out for that. Also, um, oh, there we go. I kind of skipped ahead. So use the conversation, the chat function to interact with us. And if any tech issues occur, um, don't worry about it. Um, we have Norman here to back us up and we'll get it sorted as soon as possible. Just sit tight and have what Isabel calls um, virtual patience. Is that what you call it? Or tech? Yeah, patience. that's right. Yeah. OK, um, next thing is 
So, oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, everyone just have your pen and paper on hand uh, at your table because we'll be doing a quick activity later. Uh, don't worry, you don't need to take notes of our slides or the session because you will be getting a copy of the slides uh, after the session is over. VLAN team will be sending that over to you. So just keep like a pen and paper on standby for a quick activity that we'll be doing midway through the session so that you get to experience it and learn how to apply it in your workplace as well. Oh, Elle, I think you're still on mute. Um, can someone unmute me? <laughs> there you go. Okay, great. Have I been unmuted? Yes, you are. All right, cool. So I'm guessing everyone's got their pen and paper already and we'll move forward. So, um, yeah, this is us. So that's Isabel and myself. I am Janelle. Or for short, we actually like calling ourselves Belle and Elle. That's um, right. Okay, so I'll introduce myself first. I am the learning and growth lead at Store Hub, which is a POS company. Uh, right now, we are also offering food delivery using bpit.com. Uh, uh, I think we're we're doing delivery to Malaysia and Singapore as well. So shout out to City, who's in Singapore. Uh, previously, I was the associate director of programs and a design thinking that's DT coach at D School Malaysia, where I met Isabel and we've worked together for a couple of years before. Over to you, Isabel. Thank you, Elle. So currently I am the founder and consultant at Busy Buds Co. So Busy Buds is actually a boutique firm that helps companies with their talent management. And we also work on consulting for other trainers and people who want to share knowledge on how they can design the best possible learning experience. For example, this webinar that you're seeing right now, things like this are things that we like to curate over at Busy Buds. And we have a lot of articles and free content on um, measuring performance, uh, being productive, and growing trust within your organizations. Before this, as Janelle mentioned, I used to be in the D School Malaysia, which is known as the Design Thinking School of Malaysia. And I had the role of a marketing manager and I was in charge of partnerships. Fun fact, despite uh, my current career background, uh, my degree and my past experience was actually in law. So this just goes to show that life can take you in many different directions. It's just what you make of it. So with that, I'd like to hand it back over to Elle to take over for the intro of our session. Right, thanks. Uh, okay, so um, earlier Sarah mentioned, right, that you just had lunch. We're kind of fighting against all, all the food that you've eaten and you might be feeling a bit drowsy, which is why we love to begin our session with a warm up. Okay, but because we're in a virtual session, we won't be making you do any push ups for this session. Phew. Instead, it'll be a different kind of warm up. Okay, so I'm going to be playing a video and do pay attention. Let me know if there's anything you want to add on um, or anything you notice uh, about this video. Okay, so I hope you guys are ready. I'm going to press play now. Somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. Why, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. But, but how did you know? Madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not plant petunias until May is out. Take her away. Sorry, it's just a matter of observation. The real question is how observant were you? All right, so that's it for the video. Um, did you guys notice anything interesting about it? Please feel free to share your answers in the chat box. Or you can unmute yourself. So while I'm in presenter view, I, I can't actually view the chat box. So you can just unmute and, 
and have a chat as well. Did anyone notice anything interesting? Anything at all that you would like to call out? Maybe we can ask Amanda. Amanda, are you there with us? Hi, yeah. Hi, Amanda. Did you notice anything about this video? Um, not too sure it was breaking just now. Yeah. Anyone else would like to share? Oh. Hattie says that, the, that she noticed the clock on the floor looks different. Right, okay. I noticed that the spelling mistakes at the front of the uh, intro. <laughs> <laughs> Who done it? Yeah, I think that's like a, a slang um, for like crime and mystery sort of um, themes. But okay, that's interesting. So you notice something different about the clock. That's really cool. Anyone else notice something that was different? Maybe I'll play the video again. Shall we do that and see if there's anything unexpected maybe? Somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. I, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. But, but how did you know? Madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not plant petunias until May is out. Take her away. Sorry, it's just a matter of observation. The real question is how observant were you? All right, so how observant were you? Good job, Kelly, on noticing that the clock was different. Anything else that you noticed? So I think um, Randall noticed that the rolling pin became a candle holder. Yeah, totally. And Kalis noticed that the vase and the flower changed. Okay. Uh, Siti noticed the same thing as Kalis. Okay. Vien, Sherlene said the bear question mark. That's right, the bear is no longer there. <laughs> <laughs> right, there was a bear and then there was the the night suit, right? Okay, so it's really Norman cool. Norman notices the hat. Okay, great. Ah, hat. Okay, so the first time, hmm, maybe you weren't so warmed up yet. The second time we played the video, there were a few um, things you spotted that suddenly changed, right? Um, can we get some guesses from you guys? How many changes do you think there actually are? So there's the vase, there's the clock, there's the bear, there's the candlestick. What else? How many changes do you think actually occurred in this video? Let's see who gets the closest guess. Yeah. Any guesses so far? I can't see the, the chat. Okay, so Kalis is guessing 10. All right. Nice. Who else? Uh, Randall, you want to give a guess at how many changes there were in the video? Pick a number. Any number will do. Amanda, you too. I know um, sometimes the video may be laggy. Sarah, just throw out a number if you want. Okay. Okay, cool. So we have 10 changes. Uh, anyone else have a, have a guess? 
Let me see. I'm trying to open the chat, but at the same time, it's a bit laggy on my end. Okay. 12 from Randall. <laughs> Boon Siong, die low. I don't even notice any change. Don't <laughs> die, Boon Siong. Don't worry. Some of us don't notice these changes in the first round. <laughs> yes. Darren says nine. Siti guesses eight. Sarah also guesses 10. Cartigan says 10. Okay, Cartigan, Sarah, and um, let's see. Kalis, let's see how close you guys are. Randall is the highest. He says it's 12. Okay, okay Randall. Okay, I see you. Who's ready for the reveal? Let's get a drum roll. Drum roll. <laughs> okay, so let's see what actually happened in this video. <sighs> The real question is, how observant were you? Twenty-one. Uh, uh, clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. Well, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. Nice one. Randall is the closest. Right, so I'm just going to exit the this so that I can see you guys. All right, so there were actually 21 changes. Good job to a lot of you who spotted, um, you know, some of the things like the clock and the, the plants. So what can we learn from this video? I think there was one person who didn't even notice any difference. So maybe you were paying a lot of attention to the story. You were trying to figure out who was the murderer, right? But behind the scenes, there was so much actually going on. So what can we learn from this video? Type whatever you're thinking. Look at the bigger picture. Very cool. Thank you, Kalins. Every little details are important, totally. Anyone else? Maybe one more. We only see what we want to see. Things can change without you even knowing. All these responses. If you have any more, go ahead and type them out. But they are so great, such different perspectives, and you are all right. So sometimes we come into meetings, discussions, our experiences, being prepared with an objective, and that's great. You should always come in prepared. That being said, acknowledge that there will also be things that surprise you, that you might not have considered, maybe you even overlooked, or that you just don't know about yet. So when you approach things with both that sense of preparedness, but also that openness that you could miss something right in front of you, you will be at a lower risk of making poor decisions. Because when you've trained yourself to think in a way where I'm always going to prepare myself, but I'm also always open um, to, to things that I might have missed, you will not fall into the trap of making assumptions, having a lack of testing, or saying things like, but it worked before what? So it should work again, right? So this video proves to us that sometimes we miss even the most obvious things. So I hope that you remember this takeaway from the video. And I hope you're now more awake and warmed up. Okay, um, just give me a moment, yeah, Elle. Do you see my slides? Uh, no, I actually see um, all of us in this video. So oh. this screen. Okay, yeah, we see, I can see your, the, the slides now. Great. Okay. Do you see my bar at the bottom or is it just the slides, Elle? 
just a slide. Oh Fantastic. wait, I see, I see the your Mac um, icons, like your trash. Okay, yeah. give me a moment. Just correcting, course correcting. Okay, Let's keep that come here. Sorry, I'm not sure why, but um, so heads up, guys. Elle and I are very new to Microsoft Teams, but we've been trying our best to make sure that we are ready for you today. And it's been taking a little bit of adjusting. I don't know about you guys, but I'm more familiar with Zoom personally. All right. Uh, let me see. I think I've got it up. Elle, can you now see it in full slide mode? Yes, it's perfect now. Thank you, Belle. Thank you for your patience. All right. All right. Go ahead, Elle. Okay, so now we've come to the point, what is design thinking? So if you've asked this question before, you might have found that different people have different versions of what thinking is. And it may cause you to wonder, is it a process? Is it a methodology or framework? Or is it just modern tools that we use to get more creative? So the thing is, people often see the creative side with it. You know, when people think about design thinking, oh, that poster's everywhere. Because it is fun, it celebrates diversity in an open mind and environment. But what people tend to miss, um, if you're only looking at the pictures, is that uh, design thinking is also a critical approach towards problem solving. So it's really about digging into patterns, asking why, and recognizing our own tendencies or biases. So that's why we consider it a critical and a creative approach um, towards uh, problem solving. On the other hand, I would like to call out a different definition. So all of, all of this is, is things that Isabel, Belle, and myself have thought about. Okay, how would we encapsulate design thinking? We would also consider it a practice of empathy and experimentation. So empathy is really about understanding what the issues are before then exploring what the possible solutions are that make sense for it. So it's not a shock and kind of situation where, oh, there's a trend right now, let's follow it. It's more, okay, what do we really understand about the issue so that whatever we explore in terms of solutions, mm -hmm. it intentionally makes sense for that issue. Okay, so it, 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 roughly, that's what design thinking is about. Let's zoom closer into a part of design thinking. We have Belle. Okay. Sure, guys. Uh, just checking in again. Elle, do you see my slides? Yep. OK, great. So guys, today uh, we're going to be talking about design thinking, as mentioned by Elle. And design thinking is all of those things like she mentioned, right? There is a process involved in it as well. And this is the five-step process that we know and that we learned at the Design Thinking School of Malaysia. So typically in a challenge, and when we say challenge, it could mean like a, an issue or a growth opportunity that your organization or company has. We find that design thinking is a process with a logical transition from one phase to the next. All right. These are put down into five steps. Now, many business leaders, CEOs have probably been applying this process. But what design thinking has done is they have actually put it into a clear framework and process, which we can now translate across the borders to everyone so that they, too, can now implement creative design processes and critical analysis and thinking. So the first step that we have is empathize. And empathize is about understanding the complexities and the depth of the problem. So I'm going to use the word problem or challenge here. They both mean the same thing. Uh, for example, you might have a challenge in your organization of, I now need to know what new service I can offer after the movement control order has been lifted in my country, right? Or any restrictions in relation to the pandemic. So that is a challenge, right? And what we do with empathy, let's take that same challenge and we go through the five steps is, first I wanna understand what does that challenge involve, okay? Identify any gaps or assumptions that I have, um, immerse myself in the experience and have purposeful conversations about it. The second step is about, now that I've spoken to people about it and understood a little bit more about the problem, I need to make sense of the problem. 
I need to put it into such a way that I can use what I have learned and give myself direction so that I can design a solution. So this is about critical analysis and developing insights. I don't want to read in too much into what I've typed out on the slides here. In, instead, I'd like you guys to read it for yourself, but I'll explain to you that first it begins with understanding what the problem is, and that is what empathy and define is all about. After we understand the problem in design thinking, only then do we go into thinking about a possible solution. All right, and then we come into the ideate stage, which is all about generating a whole ton of ideas. It's like, what can we come up with? And here is where we get to flex our creative muscles just a little bit. Uh, we actually look at what are the different tools, tips, tricks that we can apply in order to open our minds and think about solutions we might not have thought possible before. I really, this is one of my favorite steps, just FYI. The second one, uh, I mean, the fourth step is actually about prototyping. So this part is all about making the idea that you had real, but making it real in such a way that you're not spending too much money on an idea, that you've got the time to test it out and quickly make changes where necessary. And finally, we have the testing phase, which is about gaining a deeper understanding about how your solution might work. So you have built a prototype. We came up with an idea, um, maybe I took some cardboard boxes, I've taken some cellophane tape, put it together, and now I want to test whether or not people actually think it's worth it. Is it even going to help them solve their problem? The thing is, we'll only know these things if we actually test it on the field. And that's the beauty of design thinking. Instead of sitting down and talking about it in a boardroom, we are out there checking if it's actually going to work or not. And put all these five steps together, of course, it's like many different parts of a tool, but uh, we only have one hour for today and we're gonna focus on the first step with, which is empathize, all right? Before I go any further though, do you guys notice that there are some loopy lines around the different circles? So those loopy lines just mean that it's not a linear process, design thinking. I can start with empathy and move all the way to test, but in a project, the reality is sometimes I might need to go from test back to define or from define to prototype. And after I prototype, I might think, oh my gosh, I think I'm really on the wrong track. I want to go all the way back to empathy again. And that's perfectly fine. These are five different steps that can be applied across the board, depending on the situation and the suitability. But the core of design thinking, where most of this stems from, is actually all about empathy. And that's why we want to take you guys through a little bit more of what empathy is today. All right, Elle, I'll hand it over to you to explain through a scenario. Thanks, Belle. So um, this is something that actually happened um, uh, when we were empathizing with someone. So we had this challenge of how might we help millennials to adopt healthy lifestyle practices? So we, we started off with this um, question, right? So we went out there and spoke to a few different people and, and this one lady, um, we spoke to her because she seemed to be like pretty fit. You know, she was in her workout uh, clothes. And, and so we're talking to her about her, her lifestyle. She says that she's really into fitness. She works out every, she, she exercises every week. She drinks a lot of water. But what I also noticed was a box of cigarettes uh, next to her handbag. So I asked about that, like, hey, you mentioned you're so into a healthy lifestyle. Why are you smoking? So I want to uh, move on to the next slide. Right, so what she said is that she's health conscious, right? So that's what is, is um, clearly obvious to us. Um, but what she's actually doing is is smoking cigarettes, right? So I wanted to dig deeper. What is underneath the surface of the water, right? So what is at the deep end of the iceberg for her? And what I learned is that in her organization, uh, all the managers and leaders are smokers. So what that means is that for her to be part of the conversation or to make herself visible to managers and leaders in her organization, she has to smoke as well. So then she can talk with them, you know? So um, that's, that's kind of the, the depth part, like why she does what she does. But if you also notice, under the surface, so people are really complex beings, right? What you see is not always what you get. 
So underneath the surface, we wanted to understand what are the other feelings, beliefs and values that she's holding. So what even caused her to want to mingle with top executives, leaders in her office? So we found out that um, she's actually the, the breadwinner um, in her family, meaning that she supports her family financially. Uh, what happened when she was younger is that her parents actually came from um, a really poor background. So they didn't have a lot of money and they had to work really hard in order to send her to school. And so she feels this sort of um, sense of loyalty, but also responsibility that because you sent me to school, I really need to earn enough money to support everyone. Right. So, so what we've learned is that this value of um, family responsibility was a very big part of her life, which ironically affected how she is at work and even her health. So she's willing to sacrifice her health by smoking just so she can get ahead in her job to help her family. So when you look at the complexity of someone, when you really empathize with not just what people do, but why they do the things they do, what kinds of values they hold, you might find um, a, a more important way to move forward. So in, in her case, it was really about understanding how do we merge the importance of healthy lifestyle practices with the prospects of progressing in her career. So when it comes to solutions, we won't just be coming up with like, oh, hey, let's start a, a, a gym, a cycling gym. You know? coming up with solutions that make sense to, to real people. Okay, so that, that's just a, an example of how it would look like to empathize in, in real life. Oh, Belle, you're muted. Thanks, Elle. So I guess Elle made a really good point, uh, which is you now understand a deeper level about what people are thinking, feeling, their beliefs and value systems. Now, what does this mean for us in our organizations, in our workplace, uh, in our businesses, right? So the thing is that when problems are better framed, all right, solutions are more impactful because they're based on actual needs of people that the solutions are being designed for. And when you take an insight like that, instead of just building a gym, which she may or may not visit, you'd actually be able to tackle the issue of how can she change her habits for the better. Maybe it means creating a better social circles where top executives want to interact in a healthier environment. And so that encourages her to take on healthy habits because she also gets to progress in her career while being healthy. You're not putting, if I could describe an analogy for this, if your ship is sinking, instead of taking um, a piece of tape or chewing gum and trying to clog up the hole, we're actually fixing the problem why the leak keeps happening, right? And that's what design thinking does. It makes you look at where does the real problem stem from? And because it's a real problem, when I come up with a solution, I'm not just plugging up a hole. I'm actually building something that will last a lot longer and create a better impact. So this is a quote that Elle and I really love. The point of design thinking is to challenge your automatic thinking and assumptions. And that's what empathy is all about as well. It is about challenging assumptions that you might have. If you saw a lady like her smoking, you just think that you just assume naturally that, oh, uh, no, if you saw a fit person like her, you might assume that oh, she's fit. She must work out a lot. Health is a priority. Right. But was health really the top priority for her or was making it ahead in life even more of a priority for her? And Elle realized that because she was observant, she noticed the pack of cigarettes on the side and she decided to ask her a little bit more about it. All of which would not have come about had Elle not had the sense to carry out a conversation with empathy. All right. So my question right now, which I'd like to throw across to everyone, Elle, if you can help me type this into the chat box, right? What do you think empathy, the word empathy means here and how does it work? Don't worry, there's no right or wrong answer right now. I generally would like to understand what everyone thinks empathy is and how it works. And I'll be more than happy to share with you more details about that shortly. Can we have a couple of answers? And maybe I'll call upon one or two people as well. Oh, Elle, are you muted? Sorry. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Boon Siong, uh, Boon Siong asked, uh, listen, sorry, he, he responded, listen with the view to understand. 
Very good. Very, very good response. I love that. I actually got goosebumps. Thank you so much, Wu Xiong. Um, Wu Xiong, can you unmute yourself and actually explain a little more? Um, I think it's basically, I think sometimes we, like just from the film, I mean the video just now, that mm. I, I don't even notice anything that's changed, right? But, mm -hmm. but empathy listening is basically to really put your focus to to listen with the view to understand deeper what the problem is. Now. I mean, hopefully with that kind of understanding, then that will help you frame the solution. That is so well put, Bun Xiong. Thank you so much. Are you a design thinker yourself? You sound like one. Uh, no, not yet. Learning. <laughs> Learning not <from> yet. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Bun Xiong. Appreciate the sharing. All right. Um, I'm going to... Ask you to have to meet yourself again, but thank you so much for sharing that point. Uh, let's hear from one more person. Elle, do you have anyone you think we can ask? Actually, Belle, we have quite a number of responses here from Sarah, understanding others' feelings. From Kathy, understanding from the other's perspective. YC, understand others' feelings from a different point of view, which I think these mm. three, you're onto something. You're, you're pretty much saying the same thing with different words. I really like Randall's comment as well. Attempt to feel pain points of another. Mm. And Shirlene uh, says, trying to put yourself in another person's shoes. Perfect. Wow. Perfect answers and all correct. Ella, how did we get so lucky with this kind of audience? I mean, yeah. they're really hitting the nail on the head. And um, yeah, you're all already design thinkers in the making by virtue of the fact that you already understand the basics of empathy, which is the core of design thinking. And you know, what's interesting is that someone said to feel what the other person is feeling, uh, listening, right? Um, but listening to understand. And um, what were some of the other words? It was to put yourself into someone else's shoes. So I'm going to show you um, what we do in empathy, all right? In empathy, there are three ways we can actually conduct empathy in design thinking. The first is to observe which is uh, what Janelle did in her example. She observed the cigarette packet um, and she looked at the demeanor of the girl in front of her. Observing could also mean, you guys ever have that those moments where you are sitting in a coffee shop or in a restaurant, you have nothing to do and you're just people watching? That is actually a form of empathy, all right? And then we have immerse. Immerse is like, I think, was it Sarah who said feeling what the other person feels earlier? So... Yeah, people said Okay, yeah. so guys, this is definitely right. And what we do in Immerse is, in order to feel what the other person is feeling, we actually try to go through that journey as well. So an example that I was always um, shown in Design Thinking School Malaysia, which I really liked was, for example, when it's um, a disabled person taking public transport, how will you understand what it's like for them until and unless you actually put yourself on that wheelchair and try to roll yourself up a ramp or take the lift to go and catch your train in time, right? So immersion, putting yourself literally sitting on that wheelchair, even if you're an able-bodied person and taking that whole journey is one way to immerse and understand another person's point of view. Literally putting yourself in their shoes and trying it out for size. And then the last one, which is also um, part of what Boon Siong answered just now, to listen with, uh, for understanding, involves the step called engage. Okay, engage means... I engage you in a conversation and I try to understand a little bit more about your feelings, beliefs and values um, based on what you're telling me. And now in an engaged situation, it's always 20% of us talking, 80% of the other person speaking because we seek to understand. And that is how you listen to understand. The minute you find yourself trying to say, oh, I understand how you feel or justify something that another person is saying, you're not listening to understand anymore, are you? So why don't you guys share in the chat box while I continue explaining, right? I think I'd really like to hear from you guys. How do you listen to understand? All right. In the meantime, I'm going to continue sharing for the rest of our presentation slides. So now we come to a really exciting part. We are going to be doing an activity. Uh, so after you finish sharing your thoughts on how it is to listen for understanding, thanks for that prompt, Boon Siong. Now I would like those of you who have done that to actually grab a piece of paper and pen, the one I mentioned in the very beginning. We are going to be doing a journey map activity. Uh, can I have, if you've ever done a journey map or you understand what a journey map is, uh, please let us know in the chat box also. L, let me know if you see anyone who actually knows what a journey map is. All right. 
Okay, so in this activity, for those of you who do not know what a journey map is, this is one of the tools we can use in design thinking. Uh, for this activity, okay, so let me explain what a customer journey map is before I jump the gun. It is a, a visual representation of the process a user or a customer for companies, we call them customers, right? Or prospect might go through in order to achieve a goal with you and your company. So with the help of a user journey map or customer journey map, you can get a sense of a customer's motivations. I think it was Randall who mentioned earlier their needs and their pain points, right? So this is one way that you can capture it visually and have a clear picture of what that looks like in order to determine what to do next. So the important words here are needs and pain points and having that visually out in front of you. So for today's purpose, we're going to use a journey map to make sure we're all on the same page for an experience that many of us go through. So what does this place look like? Um, let me see, can you call out a name, Elle? Um. Or if anyone would like to just jump in there, please go ahead. Um, um, Kathy, are you there? I think I saw Kathy. Yep. Kathy, what do you think the scenario looks like? Um, a bank. So I think multiple things. People are trying to open an account or uh, buy gold or open a <laughs> uh, find a checkings account, I guess. Okay. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you so much for sharing that. Okay, it's exactly what you said it is. It is a bank. And in a bank, we have so many different types of experiences. And I'm sure a lot of you, everyone in this room has had some sort of experience with a bank, right? So I guess this is the best place to start with. Um, normally, if you're in a company or an organization, for example, uh, if you are in a pharmacy, you might want to do a customer journey map for the user experience when they come in to buy prescription medication, right? So these are the ways that you have to pick a scenario and a place in order to set up your journey map. The scenario we've picked for today, as Cathy mentioned, is the bank. Um, and this is what a customer journey map looks like. So this is a bank branch customer experience journey map. I've created a very simple one for all of us to use here today. So if you can quickly sketch out what this looks like on your piece of paper, that would be great. Um, we want you to do something like this okay so this is this is the bank i want you to list out uh, if you can see the pink arrow here list out all the touch points that you have with a customer so for the bank this is for a customer this is probably the process that they experience and now if you see that dotted line with the smiley face and the sad face usually you would mark that at each phase that you are at is your experience good or not so good how good is it this is how a completed uh, customer experience journey map should look like. You see how it's marked out with all the X's there? So I want you guys to take two minutes. I'm going to set the timer right now. And I want you, or maybe one minute is fine, I think. Because I know a lot of you have already um, thought about, you know, experiences in the bank that you have. Can you quickly just mark down what your experiences are? whether it's good or bad, based on the phases right here. Your time starts now. You'll we'll also see that on my screen there is a visual timer. This is something that design thinkers love, having a visible timer. Okay. Hey. Hey. Remember, I want you guys to think now, as you fill this up, I'm going to talk to you guys. So think about when you enter the bank, right? And right now, there are new SOPs in place. If any of you have entered a bank with the new SOPs in place, how has that experience been like for you? Was it good? Was it bad? Was it just okay, neutral? Mm, what process do you have to go through now when you enter the bank? Then it comes to taking a number. What does that feel like? After that, you've got your waiting period. What happens during your waiting period? All right, um, are you sitting down? How long is it? Is it comfortable to sit down? Do they make you feel entertained while they're sitting down? Are you bored? 
All right, so I think our one minute is up. Thank you, Elle, for holding up the time timer. Um, all right, guys. So I guess right now I would like to hear a little bit from all of you. You're a customer, you've walked into the bank, you've marked out your own experience in the journey map. So can I hear from like uh, one person, maybe you can just volunteer uh, to share with us what is the worst or your lowest point in this bank experience? I am going to stop sharing screen for a moment, yeah? So that I can come back here and see. Eugene, hi Eugene, I see your face as soon as I open my call. Eugene, can you tell me what for you is usually the worst part of the experience on the customer journey map? Going to unmute. Can you unmute yourself? Looks like a few people mentioned waiting period as their lowest point. Oh, Eugene has an issue with his mic. Oh, no worries. It's okay, Eugene. Uh, let's see what other people have said in there. L, who has answered in the chat? How about CT? CT, you also mentioned waiting period is the worst. Let's mm. Oh, Boon Siong actually mentioned an unhelpful teller, right, as well? Doesn't okay. I'm talking about unhelpful, uninformed. Mm. Okay, okay. So I've got two lowest points here. Uh, can I have Siti first? Siti, I haven't heard your voice since the beginning of the call, so I'd love to hear it now. Can you tell me a little bit more about the waiting period for you? Why is it the lowest point? Oh, it's quite... Um, the, the waiting time is quite long. So, especially on this current moment, right? Mm -hmm. They also have time. They given the VQ and they give the, uh, the ticket but mm -hmm. the waiting time also quite slow. Right. To me lah. Yeah. So the waiting time is is affected lah to me. But the rest so, of the other other process is rather the same. It's okay. So far it's so good. It's just the waiting period. Only. So what do you think or feel at that moment when you're waiting? I feel like going up from the bank, but I cannot. <laughs> <laughs> do you do anything as a result of that feeling? Like you feel like you want to go out from the bank. Do you do anything as a result of that? Or does it affect you in any way before you go to the, speak to the teller? Uh, not really, actually. <laughs> I don't make okay. a hoo-ha scenario over there. Mm. But how do you feel every time you have to go to the bank then? Not really. La. I, I'm, I, don't, I don't actually go bank every time. But the moment when I go bank, have to wait that kind of period, is really, it's really a pain to wait. So that's mm. why... Yeah, I try to avoid going back, actually. <laughs> okay, okay, great. So these questions are important, right? I'm, I'm showing you guys how to, what kind of questions you should ask when you're using a journey map. Thank you, Siti, for your sharing. You can mute yourself right. again. So guys, when you understand that there are emotions on the map that change, if you are the bank, this is what you need to understand. What was the person thinking or feeling at that point of time? What did that person do as a result of it? So let's see, uh, Amanda said that the teller is doing some other stuff while she's sitting in front of her and it, it causes delay and she feels like she's not getting the full attention. Amanda, do you do anything or how do you feel because when you see that happening? Um, I was quite confused la, because I was mm. sitting in front of them and then they are not serving me. And then they're doing some other stuff without telling me what to expect. It's like, um, so what now? But, right. but I didn't complain or anything. Lah. Yeah. How, how do you feel even though you didn't complain? Uh, frustrated. Yeah. Okay. Frustrated. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that, Amanda. So I'm going to go back mm -hmm. to sharing my screen real quick. You can mute yourself again as well. Um, okay, so these questions help you dig deeper and I think one more question I'd like to ask is, uh, I see someone put there, entering the bank is the best, YC. 
right? The very beginning. So that's also something that's really good to take note of. You don't only want to know what is the lowest point, but you also want to understand what is the highest point in this experience. And I will tell you why shortly. Okay. Just give me a second. Again, this is getting lagged. Uh, L, can I ask for your support to actually bring the slides back up? Sure, let me... Okay, I think in the meantime, I'm just going to ask the next set of questions um, until we can actually bring the slides up again. So now that we know what the lowest and highest points are for us as customers, I want everyone to put on the hat of the bank. Okay, you are now in the position of the bank. And in the position of the bank, how do you think the bank can move the needle from the highest point to, uh, sorry, from a lower point to a higher point. So I'm going to give you an example. The waiting period for, uh, was it Siti just now, was really bad, right? She said it's so long. Um, she goes to the bank, but really as much as she can, she, would, she doesn't need to go much anyway. But she feels, it feels weird when you get a number and even after getting your number, the wait is so long in between. So if we are the bank, how can we help move the needle from unhappy at the waiting period, which so happens I've also marked it out the same way here, to at least neutral or happy, okay? What would you do if you were the bank? Now, waiting period is usually a lot more complex to, to kind of find a solution for. So I'm going to bring up uh, someone else. It was Amanda. She said when she was speaking to the staff, she had a bad experience because the staff was doing something else and not giving her attention. So if you were the bank, what would you do to move the experience from not so good, where you feel you're not getting enough attention, to making the customer feel a little better in that situation? Um, maybe I can call on... Uh, Janelle, do you see any names that I can call on that we can uh, maybe brainstorm together? Uh, I actually haven't heard from Darren. Are you with us, Darren? Yep, I'm here. Hey, Darren. Thanks for joining hey. in. Okay. No, so, Darren, you and I now hold the role of the bank. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, what should we do or what can we do as a next step to improve this experience where our staff is doing other things and not paying attention to um, Amanda? Teach them empathy. <laughs> nice one. <laughs> Great. So, maybe we can do something where we get I'm building on your idea, yeah? And I think what we should do is get our, have a day where all the bank staff have to stand in line and experience what it's like to be a customer in their own bank. Oh, yeah. Yeah? We For have sure. an immersion experience journey. Yeah. A role play would be great. Um, okay, so we can do that. And then we have a possible scenario. So let's say we actually run this idea. What do you think a possible scenario might be after we run this idea? Uh, so possible scenario like, okay, we've done this for employees. Now, how do you think they will behave? Well, if they, they do get the sense of empathy, I mean, they do get the sense of frustration that um, the clients or the customers are facing, then for mm. sure, you know, they, they would understand that it's not a nice thing to do, right? Um, you don't right. do others what you don't want to be done onto you, right? So you you, you probably change, um, hopefully, you know, if, if they don't, <laughs> I guess as a bank, you will really know who are the good ones. Yes, such a good point. And I like that idea that we just came up with together. Thank you for joining me for that mini ideation session, Darren. You're welcome. So not only have we done an empathy experience, we've also done a little bit of ideation right there. So guys, if you Sorry. If you actually look at this um, journey map, I've added another portion at the bottom, which is called the insights portion. So this is after we understand what our customers are going through, we put potential next steps where we can move the needle. Sometimes you've got a really great experience, like entering the bank is the best. So what works there and how can you leverage on that to create a great experience in another part of the journey? So maybe entering the bank is simple, straightforward, and someone is smiling when they greet me. How can I use that formula in another part of the journey to make the customer experience work well? And then you think about project the scenario. Okay, if I put this solution, 
what might possibly happen, okay? So don't worry, you get these slides, so you can create your own customer journey map as well. But the next important question we've got to ask ourselves is, yay, we've created a customer journey map. Uh, now what? <laughs> okay, so just because you've designed your map doesn't mean your work is done entirely. This is the most important part of the process, analyzing the results. How are people responding to what you're doing? Where do you lose their attention? How can you better support your customers? These are some of the questions you should be able to answer once you have finished your journey map, actually. And analyzing the result um, can show you where your customer needs are being unmet and where you should be focusing more of your attention on. Okay, Because this exercise of drawing a customer journey map remains hypothetical until we've actually tried it out for ourselves and done something about it. So you've got to take the customer journey, go through their process. That's why Darren's idea was great, where he gets uh, the staff to actually go through the process. This is actually one step of a customer journey map. It's not enough that you plot it out. You take it for yourself, you implement your solution and see how it works. After that, you make the necessary changes, of course. So that you can, and you know that the changes that you're making are actually good changes because they're meeting actual needs of your customer. And that's how empathy and customer journey map come together to create actionable results that you can act upon within your organization. And with that, that's all from me for this part of the session. I think I'd now like to open it up for Q&A if anyone has that right now. We have another four minutes on the clock. Don't worry, we won't be taking up too much more of your time. So you can post some of those questions in the chat. You can ask us out loud. Do we have any questions, Al? So far, none. Although we do have a lot of answers for the previous questions, which is great. Okay, I see one question here from Darren. Mm -hmm. On the point of empathy, what would you do if the other party doesn't want to open up or share for us to better understand, for us to understand better? Sure. Elle, would you like to take that one or do you want me to? Um, okay, so, so yeah, I, I can start it first. Mm -hmm. So, um, Based on my own experience of uh, trying to gain empathy with a, a particular demographic or a particular uh, group of people, if someone is uncomfortable to share, I don't think there is a there is a need to push for it. But typically, if you've already gotten their consent to have that conversation with them, and they're still hesitating to answer, uh, that could be due to a bunch of different things. Maybe you're asking too many questions all at once and then they're overwhelmed. You know, it could be so many things. But what I like to do if someone is hesitating to respond is to bring in silence. So people are normally quite awkward when silence happens, right? We go like creak, 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 awkward, awkward <laughs> silence. But actually it's really it's really useful during an empathy engagement session when you ask a question and you kind of leave it there for a while, let the person um, really digest your question and um, sort of open up to you. So if you keep pushing, it doesn't feel like a relaxed conversation. So I would say silence is a, is a really good tool. Thanks, Earl. I, I love that answer. I think I learned that the hard way when I first started doing empathy, engage interviews, right? Um, is silence is so important. Sometimes we feel awkward, we feel the need to fill up that silence. But even uh, empathy interviews, like what you're asking about, Darren, it's actually a conscious practice. Uh, it's something that uh, there's actually a way that we build rapport with a person so that we can set the tone, get them comfortable to answer our questions. Uh, my discovery from doing these kind of activities where I've actually gone on the streets and spoken to people to understand more about their experience with banks or with hospitals is that people love to talk and people love to share their experience. Although they might not give you their values, feelings and beliefs. So there's an art of questioning that we as the design thinker have to employ where we ask questions that lead them down a very focused path and get deeper and deeper. All right. And I'd love to share more of that with you. 
um, you know, if if you really are curious about that, you can drop me a message or on LinkedIn. After this, we'll be sharing our contacts. Um, these are programs that, for example, I run as well on how to engage with customers better in my organi uh, through BusyBuds Co. And we also do programs on like how to conduct effective webinars or workshops like this because we do all these things, like we conduct empathy interviews. So if you want to know more about the art of conducting an empathy interview, let's start a conversation on the site. But otherwise, yes, there is an actual technique to it and it does take practice to get there. Definitely. Uh, Darren says thanks. Um, there are two other questions which are somewhat linked um, mm -hmm. from Randall. If there is an emphasis on empathy, what if you lack it? And similarly, Kathy is mm -hmm. saying, um, what if um, in the example of the bank, uh, mm -hmm. if they're meant to play role play as the customer but are being defensive? Right, so basically, what if in that situation, the person who's supposed to empathize actually lacks empathy? Right, so that's why even, um, it, and that's a very good question, I think. So even as a design thinker, before we go out and do empathy, uh, something that I tend to do with my team or for myself before I go out is to put myself in the right mindset uh, before I go out, and that has to be done very consciously. Um, having the right mindset is important where we actually consciously tell ourselves, okay, I'm going to be user-centric. I have to have the mindset of a traveler. Like when I go on holiday, when you go to visit a new city, you look at the city in a completely different light and you put aside the judgments that you have. When you drive in your own town, you're on autopilot and you take the things around you for granted. So getting yourself into that traveler's mindset is something that we actually have to consciously do as a team before the team goes out and decides that they want to engage in empathy. Empathy is something that is inherent in all of us. It just has to be triggered and consciously awoken in each of us. And that's not impossible to do. Elle, do you have anything you want to add to that? Yes, definitely. So there is a kind of quote that I like. Earlier, someone mentioned that empathy is putting yourself in someone else's shoes. Right, But before you can put yourself in someone else's shoes, you first have to take off your own shoes. So what that means is that you almost have to forget or unlearn how you are so that you can truly get into the shoes or the mind of the other person. So before you can do that, there is actually an active step of, okay, I'm not myself right now. I'm trying to be Isabel, for example. Yep, and there are ways to do that. There are actually ways to frame your mind properly before you go out. So yeah, thanks for that question. Very, very important question. Um, please feel free to keep answering questions. But as it's 3.03 right now, I would actually really like to move on and quickly wrap up our session. Um, so I guess the last part is I would like everyone to now type into the box if they, like, em based on what you've learned about empathy, was there anything new you discovered today about empathy? Um, was there something that was re-emphasized for you? Like you have a belief about empathy or you have a belief about um, how people should approach a problem. Uh, was anything new for you or was it emphasized for you? We'd love to know in the chat box. Um, and finally, if everyone could also take the time, your feedback is a gift to us. And in return, we have a gift for you. I have, uh, if you take the time to complete our feedback, you can just scan the barcode over here with your phone or you can key in the link at the bottom of the barcode over there. Take the time right now to finish this feedback. And what we will do is actually, uh, as soon as you finish the feedback, you will get an email with two additional links that will tell you more about creating a customer journey experience map. So you can take what you've learned in our session and expand on it to actually apply in your teams as well. All right, I'm going to leave this up here just for a moment. Um, and then after that, I'm going to be flipping it over to our LinkedIn pages. L, maybe what you can do is just uh, put our names there so that they can find us on LinkedIn in the chat box. Sure. Um, can you and, move the next slide? It has our names as well. Oh, okay. Ta-da! All right. So you can also scan this barcode if you want to connect with us on LinkedIn. Uh, we'll be more than happy to connect with you on a professional level if you have questions on 
design thinking, customer engagement, user centricity. Um, these are all things we'd love to talk about. Uh, you can reach L for more conversation. You can reach me too. And especially because of my work with Busy Buds, I'll be more than happy if you guys are interested to know more on how you can get further training on this or attend a further workshop on this. Um, CT, I know you wanted to connect because you were looking at ways to create more engaging online experiences as well. Uh, yeah, drop me a message. Okay, and Elle, do you have anything you want to say since we've come to the end of our session? Yes, I really hope uh, you guys learned something new and had a lot of fun while learning as well. Uh, as Isabel mentioned, we're really open to connecting. Uh, talk with me if you, your organization or your team is looking at uh, solving a, a complex problem or you would like to know how to collaborate better, speak with us. Um, we're very happy to help. If you guys, uh, and now since we're at the end and we wrapped it up really nicely right there, uh, if you guys want to say anything, add anything about the session or about what you've learned, turn on your mics and share it with us right now. If not, just to say bye also can. <laughs> and thank you guys for being so uh, open to responding and typing in chat box. Hey, just want yep, to thank I both of you, Ellen Bell. Uh, I think both your examples we, at the end especially really helped to cement in uh, a lot of the sharing done earlier because it was very personal and very um, relatable. So, but also thank you for walking us through the process. Really, really enjoyed it. Thanks. Thank you, Kathy. Yeah, thanks guys. Um, uh, you know, it's a great session. Um, uh, very interactive uh, and interactive for all of us. Uh, thanks for taking time as well uh, in sharing for this past one hour. Oh, it's my pleasure. My pleasure actually having you participate with us too, Darren. Thank you. No worries. I'm going to stop screen share just so I can like see a little bit of everyone as well now. I think we've given enough time to connect there. Um, if you have any other questions on how to connect with us, I can share that in the chat box for you guys. Uh, Amanda, Siti, thank you for being here. We have 12 people with us still. Oh, that's great. So yeah, anyone anyone else wants to say anything really quick before you go? Bunsyong, I got to hear your voice. Randall, I got to hear from you too. That was fantastic. All right, thanks, Randall. I'm glad that it was uh, refreshing for you. That means I'm doing my job right. <laughs> In the meantime, if you have nothing else to say, don't worry. Bye, everyone. It was such a pleasure being with you on this lovely Tuesday afternoon. And Sarah, hopefully you didn't fall asleep, yeah? Bye. Thanks, Al. Thanks, Bell. Great session. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yip, yip. Uh, no worries. Then just if you can't register the mobile number on the feedback form, uh, just put a... Okay, cannot key in the plus sign. Duly noted, very good feedback on the form. So just put in your number if you can. Yep. And, and your country code in the front, if it's like six or four, four, just write the numbers. Yay, thank you, Amanda. Oh, I won't let you go on. Okay, why don't, um, so you cannot key in any numbers at all, is that right, Yip? I can quickly rectify that situation right now. Thank you, Cartigan. Um, 
to you if it doesn't accept the extra number. OK, you can always remove the first zero. Okay, okay, I will just take it off from being required. There we go. All right. Great, thanks Yip for the... Um, that was really good feedback from Yip. Doesn't allow the dash. Also, thank you Yip for doing the feedback form. I think that was really good. Darren has done it too. Oh, great. Vien, oh, I loved your energy too, Vien. Thank you. Keep in touch. Oh, yes, we will. How are you feeling, Elle? Is everyone gone? No, oh. we still got a couple more people here, I think. Uh, let me see. They're just leaving the room. Just enjoying the vibe here. <laughs> Maybe we'll start dancing for you guys, no? <laughs> Leave. The leaving dance. Bye. <laughs> Come to the end. <laughs> or maybe or maybe everyone has fallen asleep from their lunch and they're just like asleep here with the video on. <laughs> Hopefully not. Either either that or we're way too entertaining. I mean <laughs> I actually would really like to capture the chat from this session too. Norman, are you still with us? Yeah, yeah, I'm still here. Hey Norman, is it possible for us to get a copy of this chat as well? Mm, uh, I think it is. It's possible. Let me try to download it. Cool, thank you. Um, in a screen capture, did you get a screen capture while we were um, having our session? I couldn't because I was sharing, so I'm wondering if Norman did. Uh, we've got it all recorded. <laughs> uh, in a video, right? So yeah. I guess we can take screenshots of the video because it would be mm. nice to um, uh, put this up on LinkedIn, get people excited to join more of the webinars. Right. 